Today is March 31st, 2019. My name is Morgan Keeler, and I am interviewing Mr. Abel Cavalla for the Voss's Oil Oral History Project, and we are sitting at Texas A&M Corpus Christi in Corpus Christi, Texas. Mr. Cavalla, thank you for sharing your perspective with us. Um, and as we've already explained, um, your interview will be housed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection um, at the University of Texas at Austin. Please know that if there's anything at all that you don't wish to talk about, you do not have to. And if there's anything you want to talk about that I don't ask you about, please feel free to interject. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started unless you have any more questions. No. Okay. So could you tell me about growing up in Corpus Christi? What was your experience? Uh, and um, <clears throat> Growing up in Corpus Christi, I grew up on the west side, on the, on the Mexican-American side of town. It was a, a poor area of town, somewhat poor. Uh, when you're growing up, you don't realize you're you're poor, right? But uh, that was that was uh, my experience. Uh, Corpus Christi was very segregated back in the '50s. I was born in 1949, so I grew up in the '50s. It was very segregated, you know, so pretty much racial lines around town. Of course, over the years, that racial line moved because of the growth of population. So uh, eventually, like today, you know, there those lines. There, those lines still exist to a degree, but not really. But. And did you speak Spanish growing up? I, I spoke Spanish in the neighborhood. Uh, the neighborhood, mo almost all the kids there spoke Spanish. So if you didn't speak Spanish, you'd be pretty much outcast. But I, I spoke uh, English at home because uh, uh, my, I guess my mother was, very, was adamant that, that we uh, excel in English and in school. And as a result, I was one of the few kids in the neighborhood that went to a Catholic school, which is a private school. Um, and so you, you said you went to a Catholic private school. Um, what was your school experience like? Uh, the school uh, here was, in terms of racially, it was about 50-50. There were some Catholic schools that were all white, and there was a couple of Catholic schools that were all brown. But the one I went to was, was about half and half in terms of ethnicity. There was no blacks that I, that I recall. Uh, but it was, it was brown and white, and uh, it, was, it was a good education. Um, and growing up um, here and going to school here in Corpus Christi, I mean, even through high school, were there any people that stick out in your memory that really influenced you, like a teacher or maybe, um, I don't know, like an after-school club person? I don't know. Uh, in, the, in the Catholic high school, I think just the whole uh, educational experience was, was uh, I could say that each of, each of those teachers uh, influenced me, I think. Uh, they were mostly nuns. We had, uh, over the years, we had one or two uh, non-religious uh, teachers, but most of them were nuns. Uh, they were, uh, education was pretty um, uh, important uh, in, the, in the Catholic system, so. Um, and when did you decide that you wanted to go ahead and pursue higher education? Uh, it was understood in my family, okay? My mother was, was uh, I guess you could say, a matriarch of the family, and she was very big on education. So all uh, us three kids got education, uh, uh, college education. My sister, I think she did a couple of years, a year or two of college. and um, But my mother was also influential in the extended family. Uh, in fact, uh, she, uh, she was from the valley, and uh, pretty much the extended family over there is educated. Teachers, lawyers, um, there's a huge number of teachers in our family and uh, on my mom's side. According to your pre-interview form and just what you've told me, you said that your mom was valedictorian of her high school class. Yeah, she was a valedictorian in... Uh, I believe 1939 in uh, La Jolla um, High School. Um, incidentally, about three or four years ago, one of her uh, 
grand, uh, great grandchildren uh, was the uh, valedictorian of the same high school. Oh, that's cool. Like, you know, seven, 80 years later, you know. So, yeah, she was, she was big on education. And, yeah, that was my next question. I was like, do you think that experience for her influenced um, her emphasis on education? Yeah, and, and it was just understood in the family. You know, you, know, you get an education. It wasn't, it wasn't an option otherwise. Um, did you find it difficult to find a university that had the kind of program that you let me back up. You went to Del Mar College, correct? Yeah. Here in Corpus Christi. Yeah. Um, did you apply to other colleges? Did you, or did you just decide that's where I'm going to go to college? No, I just decided it was that's where I was going to go. It's local. It was affordable back then. Um, you know, tuition back in 1970 was probably uh, under three hundred dollars a semester, so it was affordable and it was local. Um. And did you go in knowing what you wanted to major in? Not particularly. Uh, I started out uh, studying Spanish. I uh, did a lot of Spanish courses. Uh, uh, I, I, I was close to a, uh, I think I was one uh, course short of a minor in Spanish. So I did, that was my emphasis. and then. While I was there, I switched over to psychology and sociology uh, because I was very interested in. Uh, I got very uh, politically in involved in those initial years of college, uh, straight out of the military. I don't know if you want to hear that part, but oh um, yes, so that was gonna be. You can talk about which, whichever one first. Um, you can talk about your political involvement, or I was also going to ask you about um, your decision to join to enlist in the military. Okay, uh, I went to one year of, of college uh, right out of high school. I went in the summer, and then I went a full year. And then uh, I uh, there was a little problem with the draft, so I decided to join before I was drafted. So I, I joined uh, the Navy. And um, I was in the Navy for, for two years, and during those two years is uh, I got, I. I want to say that I want to say radicalized during those military years. This is the late '60s. I was '68 through '70. Okay, in 1968, I was in um, in uh, outside of Chicago in training, and that's when there was the uh, 1968 Democratic uh, Convention, and what we called then and since then, the uh, police riot of 1968. Uh, the Democratic National Convention was going on uh, while I was in boot camp, and we were shut out from the news. So it was very curious to me that, that we, you know, they shut off the news on the base where I was in training. And then uh, there was, uh, on, on my base, there was, which we had, hadn't had before, was like all kinds of military people, tanks, weapons, and soldiers kind of in waiting for what was going on at the 68 Democratic Convention. It turned out to be a big riot. I don't know if you know that history, but uh, I happened to have been right outside the city when that was going on. And then we found out just a few later, what a few days later, what had actually occurred back then. Uh, at that time, and uh, there was a big riot. The, the military was kind of like uh, on standby for the local police. The local police had gone berserk on the on the uh, protesters. People had gone to go protest war, the Vietnam War, at the 1968 uh, Democratic Convention. And uh, Mayor Daley, who was the uh, uh, mayor of Chicago at the time was, was an authoritarian type. He'd been in office for a long time, and uh, he took it personal, and he sent his goons out to uh, bash on uh, young people, students, and even uh, journalists. A lot of journalists were injured by the police back then. All that was going on when I was in, in, in when I just got gotten into the military. Okay. Um, 
during uh, during my my time in the military, I, I realized which you know as a young person in high school you don't you don't put the pieces together necessarily, till you kind of grow up a little bit, and I I saw the uh, I saw I started to see the relationship between authority and the rest of us, and how people in authority make decisions that affect all of us, and so. In a, in the military, you see it as a it's a microcosm, because you you can see the lines of authority, you can see the the structure, you can see the uh, you can see the politics all close up. Unless unless you're an idiot, you you have to see it, okay. And so uh, injustice, uh, bullying, oppression, things like that, are are right in your face when you're in the military. And so, um, you know, in the, at anybody that's a rank above you in the military, many times they feel like they can they can kind of pee on everybody that's under under them. And so, I didn't put up with it. Okay, so I wound up, uh, you know, being being a little bit uh, radicalized by that process. Um, and so I, I I resisted that that system of. Uh, uh, I would call it bullying, it, 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 you know, and so I didn't put up with it. I had a, I had a lot of confrontations and um, uh, disputes with higher ups while during my time in the service. Okay, uh, while I was in the service, there was a lot of things going on, not just in the world, but in the, in this country. 1968 was a pivotal year in history everywhere. Movements around the world, uh, and movements here in this country. Uh, the uh, uh, there was one occasion when I went to. I happened to go to New York City while I was in Virginia, and um, I went to go visit a cousin of mine who had been living in California. He'd been living in in Los Angeles, but he was in the, in the military, so I went to visit him. And um, I got exposed to, um, of all places, New York City, I got exposed to the Chicano movement. Chicano movement really started out in California, uh, in, uh, you know, and it, it really started out in California. Uh, 19, that was about 1969 when, when I went to visit my cousin and one of his roommates who I never met had a bunch of uh, propaganda and stuff from uh, uh, Chicano movement type things, you know, buttons, posters, and things like that. And I was Im immediately just uh, blown away by that. One, because it was in New York City. Another, because it came from California. And it just so happened that during my high school years, the last couple of years of high school, I was really interested in uh, history of Mexico, the, the the politics of Mexico, and uh, we had a uh, we had a one of the teachers in high school. Uh, his name escapes me right now, but he was he was fascinating when it came to everything about Mexico. He was a, a, a white uh, teacher, but he was uh, he was he affected me a lot in, in my high school years. So when I see when I saw this stuff in New York City from from uh, California and then from my own experience in West Side of Corpus and then my high school years and you know it kind of started kind of putting things together here um, my identity as a as a, a Chicano was immediately uh, kind of all came together about that time I was about 19 years old. Okay. Were there any instances when you were in the Navy where you felt like, I guess I'm mostly like curious, like where, so you're in New York and you're still in the Navy at this time, you've got to go back to your service. What changed? Also, was there ever any time where you felt like you needed to stand up for yourself in the military? Because you... So I'm not asking this very well at all. Um, so 
So I'm going to back up a little well, bit. Well, I understand the question. Bullies. I understand yeah, okay. the question there. Uh, and yeah, uh, yeah, it was it was kind of a process of, of uh, it was a learning process and also um, where you you kind of get this uh, uh, sudden enlightenment about how how uh, decisions are made and then you learn about the structure of of the organization that you're in and um, so uh, you know it's at one point it's you know there's no particular moment but at, at one point you realize that I realized that uh, I didn't have to put up with that stuff I didn't have to put up with bullying injustice you know being being uh, ordered around for uh, egotistical reasons, having nothing to do with the job, having nothing to do with the work. There's just a lot of people going around, you know, feeling uh, self-important. And I resisted that. You know, if I was treated properly, no problem. But somebody came, you know, pushing weight around for no reason, that, that was, there was a problem. Okay, and, and uh, it's just, that was, that was me, that's how I developed. Um. You know. Could you tell me about your experience um, leaving the military and then going back to, did you go back to Del Mar College or did you I go did. to A&I then? No, I went back to uh, Del Mar College, but uh, while I was in Virginia, um, you know, I was, uh, I read a little small article in the newspaper up there about the Mayo organization. And it just, you know, it just got my curiosity because I'd never heard of Mayo. It turned out that Mayo, the organization, it was a it was a radical Chicano community organization that uh, was kind of formulated right about the time that I left, but I wasn't aware of it. So from from I think it was formed about 1968 when I was leaving, and by 1969 I, I saw a small article in the newspaper in Virginia about a uh, a school walkout here in Corpus led by, organized by the Mayo organization. And uh, it just stuck in my mind. And uh, seeing something about Corpus Christi way up there in Virginia at the time, uh, where there, back in 1970, there were essentially no Mexican Americans in that area of Virginia. There weren't any Mexicans. And so, you know, I read this about Corpus Christi and stuff going on over here and uh, you know stayed with me and so um, when I uh, got out of the service um, I, you know, I went to, well I was immediately drawn to my own the stuff that was going on here there was a lot of activities going on in, in Corpus by that particular organization I became a member of it and it wasn't where you sign up for membership. You just show up at the meetings and show up at the rallies or whatever it is. And um, we, um, uh, at, at Del Mar College was also pretty much a hotbed of the Mayo organization. Mayo was a, um, a uh, Chicano, it was the initial Chicano movement here in Texas, okay? And, um, the um, it was supported of, of by of all things the steel workers union here in Corpus Christi. There was a guy named Montemayor who was a uh, he was a steel workers organizer that encouraged us. We were all young people, 19, 20 years old, some even younger, and. Um, he would uh, they would provide meeting space for us, and you know we'd talk, you know, organize our meetings, organize our activities. Um, we we uh, uh, we had a number of um, protests uh, uh, here in Corpus Christi. Uh, on one occasion, we actually had a sit-in at the school board. We basically shut down the school board meeting here over the issue of uh, busing. There was a, another group. Uh, I missed that particular uh, meeting, but we shut down the city council meeting on one one occasion. Um, those were very interesting years. A lot of stuff going on. Uh, the, the 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 tactics at the time were uh, uh, to get attention to injustice, racial injustice, racial issues. Uh, there were a lot of them back then. 
um, you know, and um, it had a long term. It had an impact on on what's gone on in this in the state and probably the country. Um, the my organization, while we were still, you know, basically raising hell, uh, there were discussions about a political party. So while we're doing all that, you know, we're also kind of morphing over into a political party, which was a Rasonida party. And so uh, they were both kind of existing at the same time, but at some point the Mayo kind of kind of dissipated and all went into the, the political party. Uh, by 1971, uh, that was we were all over the state getting signatures to become a legal party, and um, by 1972 we had our first uh, uh, statewide campaign. We had candidates for every single statewide office, except the uh, except the court of appeals, things like that. But for governor, lieutenant governor, treasurer, we had we had candidates that we ran statewide. That had been unprecedented by any third party effort in the state of Texas up to that point. And so we managed to, we managed to get on the ballot. We managed to get, uh, uh, we had a big impact in South Texas. Uh, we had, um, uh, we uh, actually took over uh, several counties, uh, our, our party, uh, uh, Savala County was one of them. Crystal City, uh, neighboring uh, counties around there, like uh, I think it's La Salle County, which is Cotula. Uh, we uh, took over. Well, here in the Corpus Christi area, we had uh, we took over uh, neighboring Robstown. We had uh, we had a uh, city council. We had the school board for many many years. Uh, we had the da drainage district here in, in Robstown. And so, uh, and for about 20 years, we had the JP office there. Rasunida party did, okay. Um, it, incidentally, just yesterday, uh, we had the uh, Cesar Chavez commemoration march here in Corpus Christi, it's an annual thing. And we had our first governor candidate from 1972 here uh, as the Grand Marshal, that's uh, Ramsey Muniz. And uh, he'd been in prison for the last 20 something years. He got released a few months ago and uh, we commemorated him as a Grand Marshal. He can barely walk, he's in very bad health in a wheelchair, but he was there. Uh, there was uh, uh, the uh, national uh, President of LULAC was there, a guy named Domingo Garcia, he's from Dallas, he's an attorney, and he's an ex Rasunida member. So what, what we had yesterday was almost like a Rasunida reunion. We had our candidate there, we had a lot of the activists from, from back then, we had the JP, um, we had... Um, some of the, some of the old activists from those from those years from the Rasunida years they're still active in one thing or another. Here, one of them is a guy named Eric Canales. He's uh, he's been a he was a Rasunida he was in Mayo. He's a Rasunida organizer. He was in a labor organizer for many years, and right now he's a director of a human rights project that's uh, working on uh, identifying the remains of uh, uh, bodies that are found out in the de semi-desert that we have down here. Uh, he was there, uh, all kinds of people from uh, Rasunida days. In other words, those, in my opinion, those people are still here. Mm -hmm. You know, of course we're dying off, you know, uh, but because uh, that movement started 40, 50 years ago. And, uh, but there's still people here. Notice Mr. Nelson here is, he's from that era. Uh, Albro was, uh, he was at, at a and when that movement uh, was uh, um, strong. 
and he he was uh, he was helped out a lot, as I recall. Uh, incidentally, Kingsville A9 Kingsville was probably uh, where all of the activists came from back in the 70s. Uh, not all, but most, because uh, A and I was the only four-year college south of San Antonio forever, like until the 80s. This this university was when it, it was a two-year college for a long time. Uh, there was no four-year college in Laredo, no four-year no four-year college in Corpus Christi, and none in Brownsville. So it was the only one in South Texas. So everybody from South Texas had to go there, and it was affordable. You know, you didn't get to go to Harvard and places like that because you couldn't afford it, you know. So, right. so um, was your decision to go to Texas A&I, that was just the natural next step, correct? It, yes, it was the natural next step because there was no other college in South Texas. It was close to Corpus. It was affordable. Um, so how did you, you end up graduating from... Texas A&I, correct? Yeah. Uh, how did you end up uh, in law school? Well, uh, when, I, when I was in, in Kingsville, I was, I was very active in uh, Rasunet Party. We, ran, we had local candidates there in 74. Uh, uh, so we worked from 72 to 74, very hard establishing our local party, getting our candidates and stuff. We wound up winning one time in a city council there. See, Kingsville was racially divided, but whites were 50%, Mexicans were 50%, but the 50% of whites, they vote. And so we always had a problem with trying to, trying to get our people even registered, and, and so we, we could never get a majority there back in those days. But, the, but then we did. Uh, it's changed since then, but... Uh, is there any reason you feel like um, that was difficult, getting Mexican Americans to come out and vote? It, it, it it's a it's a you know traditional problem, uh, you know. Um, it, you have to I have to think of it in terms of periods of time. Like back then, uh, you know, uh, it was just getting people to register to vote uh, was was difficult. And then uh, we also, you know, that was a time, was a transition time between what seemed to be like a colonial period up into to a different period. A colonial period being where white people pretty much ran the show forever, even in, even in places where there was majority Mexican-American. White folks still ran the show. They ran, they, you know, they, 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 uh, controlled all the politics, they controlled the courthouses, they controlled the education, they controlled everything. So right about that time, there was a transition. One of the neighboring counties here, for example, Brooks County, uh, from, the, from the day that they established the county to about 1972, they only had two county judges. And one was the father and the other was the son. Okay? up until 1972, and then it, right about that time, we broke that mentality to where, you know, we weren't subjects anymore. We decided we were gonna run the show ourselves. You know, so there was a lot of things going on right at that time all over South Texas. You know, we managed to uh, win here in Robstown. We took over the city council and the school board for the school board longer. We lasted longer the school board. But uh, we had an impact for a very long time here. Um, yeah, and so then you went to law school. Oh, excuse me. And okay, yeah. so when I was when I was at A and I in Kingsville, I graduated in 1974, but I stayed for a year because I'd been organizing, been working on local newspaper, and um, I managed to get some help from the Texas Institute for Education Development, which was we called it Tide, and the Tide was doing the same thing throughout all of South Texas. It was a San Antonio-based nonprofit organization that found funding from different sources to finance our projects in South Texas, mainly 
propaganda, newspapers and stuff, which aided in our local organizing efforts. Okay, so I worked for that one year uh, on on salary, very little salary, but it was enough to survive on. Um, and during that year, I, I, I was trying to figure out what to do personally, you know, what to do from after graduating with a degree in psychology and sociology. Uh, had a double major, and so I I, I thought about a uh, master's in social work out of San Antonio. I went over there and pretty much got ignored over at uh, 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 Our Lady of the Lake College. And so I, I said, well, uh, uh, you know, I thought about law school. Actually, my brother had started law school the that one year when I worked in Kingsville for uh, Tide, uh, and so, I decided to try to get into law school, and I got into law school at University of Houston. I got I got accepted U of H and Thurgood Marshall. And I decided to go to U of H because my brother was there, so he was one year ahead of me. And then, could you tell me about your experience um, attending, then graduating from law school? I can tell you, we're still active in law school in our politics in South Texas politics. We'd have. Uh, um, you know, of course, we have to study hard because it's it's difficult, especially that first year. But uh, in Houston, we had our local Rasunida organization, uh, and uh, we had um, um, which I was involved in. Uh, we're involved, still involved in protests. We're involved in organizing. We're involved in different projects. Um, the, uh, we also, uh, while we were in law school, we, were, uh, we had our, our local, I mean, our, we had the Chicano, we organized the Chicano Law Students Association. And so we managed to get a member of our group onto the admissions committee. So that member would try to get in as many politically active people as we could into law school as opposed to, you know, the traditional uh, type of, of student. You know, on the, on the Anglo side, the, you know, the, the, the kids that got into law school were the, were the sons of the judges and the sons of the other the lawyers and stuff. Our parents, none of them were lawyers back then. Very few. I don't remember anybody who had a parent who was a lawyer who were basically, you know, uh, you know, poor West Side kids that managed managed to get an education and you know get into law school, and that during that time, it, you know, it seems common now, but back then, uh, Chicanos didn't get into law schools and didn't get into medical schools, and didn't get into professional schools because they were exclusionary. We didn't have affirmative action. We had to fight for affirmative action back then. You know. Uh, while I was still a law student, I was, uh, we would organize fundraisers for, for example, the local organization here in Robstown. The Robstown organization was Familias Unidas, or United Families, Familias Unidas. And so we'd have fundraisers in Houston, we'd send three or four hundred dollars down here for the, for the local organization. It was the most active, and it was from our area here. Uh, so we did that, you know, you know, continued that as much as we could. And then when I got out of law school, uh, I went back to Kingsville. And uh, I started working with the legal aid uh, program out of Kingsville. Uh, I, I had actually worked a summer there. Um, I don't even remember if I was paid or not, but I was there for a summer while I was still in law school and kind of learned, that, you know, how. Th how things work, you know, in the community there in terms of providing legal services. So I wound up back in, in Kingsville working for legal aid for a couple of years um, after law school. And um, the um, uh, I did that for about two years. And then uh, during those two years, I was uh, actively involved in the community. We were doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, one of the things that we, we, we concentrated on back then, 
and which seems to be real popular right now is medical care. And what we decided was a priority was, was uh, we want to set up a medical clinic, federally funded me uh, medical clinic. So we organized um, a local uh, corporation for that. And it's, sorry, just to clarify, is we the Rasunita Party? Rasunita Party. Okay. Uh, we also had a local organization that we called Trabajadores Unidos, and that's uh, United Workers. Okay, and we had been involved in some worker issues at the university, uh, worker issues at the local chemical plant out there, um, and so that's the organization that was formed right about the times, 1978 or so, 76 to 78. Um, and we worked on this on this um, on this clinic project. And we had opposition, of course, from all the doctors, all the medical providers, the dentists, the politicians, everybody opposed it because it was community-based. We weren't professional medical anything, but we managed to uh, organize it. And uh, it just so happened we got funded a million dollars from the Carter administration. Carter administration was from 76 through 80. In 1980, we actually we got an award letter of a million dollars to set up our clinic in Kingsville. And it was, it was gonna be a community-based uh, board with a nurse, with a community, community people. And it was, you know, we'd complied with the, the rules. Uh, but it got canceled by the Reagan administration. So as soon as they came in, they canceled our million dollar grant. No. So uh, that'll give you an idea of what we think about Ronald Reagan and that administration, okay? So what do you, what, what's next? What do you do when you don't have that million dollars? Well, we just, I mean, we just kept organizing, kept doing, doing our thing. Now, uh, during all this, this time frame, Okay, from through the 70s to the late 70s, the, the Rasuneda Party is active all over the state. Where we have we have organizations in California, New Mexico, Arizona, Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana. And I can't think of any other state, but we had we had lots of other organizations around the country. We had uh, essentially a national organization during the, that same time frame. Let's say from seventy two uh, to nineteen eighty one, Rasunel Party was active. Okay, uh, this is something that a lot of a lot of people don't realize, but Rasunel Party. We, we never, we were local, then we became statewide, and at some point we, we got international. We, we started having uh, uh, political relationships with Mexico. The government of Mexico at one point granted our party uh, foreign aid, foreign aid for Chicanos, okay? We got uh, um, scholarships for higher education in Mexico. There were, uh, I, I, if, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, it was like a million dollars, possibly more, maybe a couple of million dollars in scholarships. We, we, had, we sent Chicano students to Mexico to study medicine, arts, uh, all kinds of different, different things. Uh, those students were on a stipends, a scholarship and stipend. They get a stipend every month, a little money from the Mexican government. And um, we also... Oh, sorry, go what ahead. was the incentive for the Mexican government to finance that? Uh, their incentive was, was to uh, embarrass the U.S. maybe uh, because American citizens are getting foreign aid uh, that was under President Luis Echevarria of Mexico. 
our leader at the time, and pretty much still, Jose Anca Gutierrez was uh, very uh, adept at, uh, you know, making contacts in other countries and other, other peoples. And so uh, he managed to get uh, the Mexican government also to send, uh, to send uh, books in Spanish for bilingual education in Crystal City. Um, they, uh, they gave us those scholarships uh, to the party. Um, during that, well, after that, uh, we had, uh, we had um, contacts with the Socialist Party, one of the Socialist Parties in Mexico, the uh, uh, I'm trying to remember their, their, their Anyway, it's the Socialist Party uh, of, of Mexico. There were th several of them. And so we had a couple of conferences with them. So we were, we were developing international contacts with the Socialist Party in Mexico during that time. Uh, we were also exposed to uh, movements from around the world uh, uh, in Mexico. We got to uh, we got to meet some of the some of the uh, exiles from Chile, who had been uh, exiled under under the uh, Pinochet uh, tyranny from those years. Uh, they were in hiding in Mexico City in safe houses. We got to meet a couple of them. Those those guys were, you know, pretty much hardline socialists, and they, they were they wanted to they wanted to assassinate them. Okay. Uh, but we got to meet some of them. They, you know, we had some really great exchanges with those people. We also had a relationship with Cuba back in, in those days. Uh, 1975, we sent uh, our our party sent a, a delegation of 20 people, 20 members of our organization and some of our administrators out of Crystal City. Went to Cuba. Went a, did a did a tour. We were invited by the Cuban government to go uh, visit. We were financed by the Mexican government because most of them didn't have any money back then. You know, we we're pretty pretty poor. But uh, the Mexican government provided uh, transportation, and they they also provided uh, our uh, our stay in Mexico City. We stayed there ten days, just waiting for the the bureaucratic paperwork to go through, we didn't pay a penny of it. The Mexican government covered it for 20 people. We stayed downtown Mexico City until everything was arranged. And then um, we flew from Mexico City to Havana and we did a tour of uh, the uh, Havana and some parts of Cuba. We got to, uh, we got to meet government officials, talk to them about you know how they how things run over there. Um, the uh, we also happen to be there on May Day. May one is International Day of the Worker, and we got to be like guests of honor there at the at the parade. A million Cubans marched uh, in the parade, and we were basically about. 20 feet away from Fidel Castro and his brother uh, Raul Castro. We did not get to meet with them because 1975 was when uh, Vietnam fell to, from the, you know, the U.S. lost the war back in 1975. May Day was a big, big day there in Cuba. There were leaders from all over the world, from uh, I mean, literally all over the world, from Spain, from Asia, from uh, Vietnam, China, uh, all over. And so those people were pretty important in comparison to our little group from of 20 from South Texas, you know. So we didn't get to meet uh, Fidel Castro back then. Did the American government know all this was going on? Huh? Did the American government know all this was going on? We didn't hide it. So yes, they knew. And when we came back, we, we actually did a lot of publicity uh, here in Corpus. There was a, we took a reporter from Corpus with us to, on, the, on, the, on the trip. He heard about it and he wanted to go. And so we said, yeah, why not come with us? 
and he wrote a series of articles on our experience in Cuba here in Corpus Christi. In the Caller Times? In the Caller Times. Okay. You could probably I'll find that. I was about to say, I'll have to look that up. Um, so, um, you were working at the um, legal aid yeah. clinic, or, um, or the legal aid office, excuse me. Um, and you're still um, working with the Rasonita party? Well, no, the Rasonita party pretty much ended in 1981. That, that was going to be my question. Yeah. So, what, what happened We there? just kind of fizzled out. Uh, we had a lot of, uh, you know, times change. Okay, and so uh, it's almost like uh, the third party movements, they run their course and they, they end. They've, they've happened before in American history. It, in, our, in our time, you know, what was happening was, there was a, we were under attack at the time, mostly from Democrats, okay? This was a Democratic Party state. Texas was Democrat up until 1994. So during the 70s, our main opponent was the Democratic Party because they were all there. The, you know, everybody was in that party, including the racists, okay? So there was no Republican Party to speak of in Texas up until 1994. They were, they were, they were in, in, in spurts, you know, they'd have activity, but pretty much out of power for forever. Uh, so what was happening back then, and it basically the, out of Crystal City, we got attacked by the Democrats of the area there, funded by the, the, the money people in that, in that area who wanted us to kind of go away. So what they did was they used the legal system to uh, uh, attack us and to weaken us as a party. And so they did it through lawsuits, through election challenges, through uh, all kinds of means, uh, you know, we suspect that we're even being funneled money into to, to divisions, to create divisions. Um, in Crystal City, for example, uh, at one point we had every single county office, but then, you know, they started attacking us and putting money, you know, the rich people putting money into these divisions. So they wound up being three groups in the Crystal City, in that area. Uh, one of them was the, uh, the Frasunida party. The other, another one was who we call the Opportunistas, the opportunists. And the other one was a Barrio Club, which was essentially a group of thugs who happened to be local people. Some of, some of whom, a couple of them were even lawyers. But we, we considered them thugs because they were they're pretty rough, you know, pretty sometimes violent. But uh, so they, you know, in time we got we got weakened those divisions, and then the lawsuits just killed us, okay? Because uh, we got sued over there uh, in an election contest, and this is not known very very much. The uh, the people that were challenging our people had unlimited funds, okay? And what they did was they deposed, you know what deposition is? Mm -hmm. They deposed every single voter in the, in the county. Can you imagine that? They even had three or four or five depositions going on at the same time. Okay? So that's thousands of people, right? Well, no, it, it's, it's a lot of people, but it's a small county. So it's okay. not like Corpus. It's a small community. Okay. So they deposed every, every person who voted and intimidated them th through the depositions. Uh, they had lawyers from San Antonio mostly that went over there to, to, to conduct these depositions. They were funded by the rich people in that, the big landowners in that, in that county. And they would ask people how they voted. And then they would bring up, you know, who are you sleeping with? Aren't you sleeping with so and so? Because all the locals know all the everything, and so people were just shocked. And then they brought in a racist judge from Ozona, Texas, to come in and, and preside over the case, over the election contest. And so that particular judge was just horrible. And so when they're doing vote counting, 
you know, if you if you got it rigged, you know, you're going to lose the election. So he uh, he decided that the election was uh, a fraud, and so they had new elections. And in the, the new elections, by then, all the voters were intimidated. They said, man, why do I want to vote? Are they going to bring out who I'm sleeping with and stuff like that, you know, or other personal things? Who's gone to jail? Whose kids have been in jail? Um, and uh, so they, um, they threw out the election, had a special election when the migrants leave. And it was a migrant community. So the migrants, a lot of them are gone. They're not there for the special election. And so the reactionary people win. And so all our people who had already won office lost except one. Our uh, district clerk, I think, uh, managed to win again, even in the special election. The rest of them lost. And then the people that won sued the ones that had won in the general election, then lost in the special election. You get sued for what, what are called emoluments of office. Emoluments of office means salary. So every one of them was sued for a quarter of a million dollars. Okay. Now, back then, I'm, I'm not a, an important person in any of this stuff, but I was in Kingsville as a legal aid lawyer, and the leader of the Unidos Party asked me to help him deal with this. Mm -hmm. And so I went uh, to Crystal City a couple of times, several times, to deal with, with these lawsuits. And uh, they were essentially for about a million dollars total, quarter of a million each one, whatever number of people they were. And I managed to settle them all out for $10,000 uh, among all the candidates that lost. And so I settled it with the San Antonio attorneys. And so each one of those people had to come up with about $2,000. And so we settled it out and closed it out. But that process was very damaging to our, to our party because, you know, our numbers had dwindled. They had attacked us legally through the legal system. They had uh, weakened us and, you know, kind of broke that hold that we had on power. And so that was about, that, that happened from 1978 to 80. We're still active in 1980. Um, uh, we had uh, conventions around the state and stuff, but uh, I think 1980 was the last one. And by um, 1981, a lot of the people that had been members of our party, we grow up, mm -hmm. you know, we don't stay the same. We get married, we have kids and stuff. And so people's priorities changed. And then because of all the, you know, uh, the attacks on our party and our, uh, you know, our persons sometimes, uh, a lot of people left the state. A lot of people went to, uh, of all places, Wisconsin. Back then it was a very progressive state and a lot of our people found good jobs up there in, in, polit in political positions, universities and stuff. Our people got educated. You know, I was a college student, and I was, then I was a lawyer. You know, a lot of the other people were college students and became, you know, they ran the local government. And then when you don't have the government anymore, where do you go? A lot of people were basically exiled, you know, from the state because of mm -hmm. all the stuff going on. So as you mentioned, um, the Rosa Nita Party kind of fizzled out around 1981, 82. That's, that's my opinion, yeah. Um, and you mentioned as well that that's common for third parties, that they'll come yeah. and then fizzle out. So what, in your opinion, is the value of a third party movement if they fizzle out like that? Well, first, first of all, uh, they don't fizzle out naturally. They, they fizzle out unnaturally, like mm -hmm. I was explaining here. We're getting a tax, you know, we're, mm -hmm. like, we don't have the resources. They have unlimited resources. We didn't, okay? And also, the, they changed the rules on us, okay? So it's harder all the time to get a third party on a ballot. Back then, we managed to do it uh, throughout the 70s. 
we were on the ballot in 72, 74, 78. That was, that was uh, you know, pretty much the decade. And then um, well, they changed the rules on us by, by making more stringent requirements on the number of votes that we had to get in order to remain a, a political party. So they upped it, you know, I think it was 2%, then they upped it to 6%. And we're talking, you know, I don't know, back then maybe 15 million votes. We had to have a lot of votes. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't meet that meet that threshold because it, basically the Democratic Party changed the rules on us. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it, it was very difficult to survive. And that's the, that's the case throughout the country. Third party are attacked by the major parties and they change the rules so that you can't organize, so that you can't stay legal. See, and when you when you have when your legal party, they pay for your primaries. So we had our primaries paid for back then. Unheard of, right? Right. So uh, when you get a third party, you get your primary paid for by the state. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, you don't have to raise, you know, sell food or sell do fundraisers to mm -hmm. to have your political party. It's funded. So we managed to pull that off through the seventies. But then they pulled the rug out from under us, and you know we couldn't survive. And times changed, mm -hmm. you know. People changed. The next generation came up, had no 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 experience with all that. Mm -hmm. So after um, that kind of nineteen eighty one, nineteen eighty two um, end point, uh, what did you become involved in after that? Uh, uh, I won't. I won't say personally, but I think most of the people that were involved in the Russian Party got involved in other things. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, for example, uh, the people in Austin, the the Russian people uh, from that area, they got involved in the local issues, uh, environmental issues. They got involved in the neighborhood issues, uh, not as a political party, but just as as activists. You know. And that happened uh, throughout uh, throughout the state. You know, it, the, the, uh, the, you know, we didn't die just be in 1981. It just that things changed. You know, the party fizzled out because a lot of people grew up, a lot of people got older, a lot of people left the state. We got attacked from all sides, and people lose interest. Okay, and so right. we we couldn't maintain that that high level of activity. We couldn't maintain it after. Essentially, 1980. And then the Reagan years came, and that was that was really rough, because people, you know, what a lot of the uh, a lot of the activists back then were, worked for social agencies. You know, they were on a salary here and there, not big salaries, but they worked for community action agencies and things like that. And then uh, they cut back the funds. Even legal aid. A lot of a lot of the activists were in the legal aid program around the state, and they they started cutting back on things that we were allowed to do. For example, we couldn't sue certain corporations. We couldn't, um, uh, we couldn't get involved in certain political type cases. We couldn't get involved in voting rights acts, uh, violations, stuff like that. So, you know, they restricted uh, the activities there and so people wound up leaving because you didn't have that base, that financial base. So people left. Those were federal restrictions you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify, making sure I understood what you were saying. Um, so throughout those Reagan years, what were you doing? I was uh, raising kids and, uh, you know, just kind of kind of keeping... Uh, yeah, it was, it was very difficult years for, for that ISI recall in terms of... Uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, political activities. So it was kind of a, for me, it was a lull there during, during those years. Uh, my, my kids were born about 1980, 81, and so I'm raising kids for the next 20 years, mm -hmm. okay? And, um, you know, uh, the organized activities were somewhat limited for me. The other people were involved in their local communities and local organizations and stuff. But, uh, you know, there were spurts of activity. For example, here in the Corpus area, we had uh, 
we still had influence in the uh, Robstown School District up through the 90s, okay? We even had, let me see, back in 80, 1986 through 88, that was in the 80s, that's during the Reagan years, uh, we took over the school district in Robstown. Uh, and uh, we got, we hired a superintendent who had been in Crystal City through the 70s. So we got power over here, so we brought in somebody with a lot of experience, then, and from our perspective. And so uh, one of the first things we did was we pretty much fired everybody at the top administration. We found out that they were stealing money in Robstown. The, 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 I call them the reactionaries. Uh, we investigated, we found that they had basically uh, stolen about $200,000 in money and salaries, and salary increase, illegal increases, okay? You can't just increase your salary without going through a process. They were kind of hiding these increases. Um, so during those years, we did, uh, uh, we did this investigation. We tried to get the local DA to file criminal charges on, on some of these people there. But there was corruption here in Corpus. So our DA here, we take him a, a whole stack, a report, investigation, the whole bit, and how they stole this money. And he hands it to a defense lawyer. And the defense lawyer gets to, gets to write uh, a response to the grand jury, which is unheard of. Grand juries are secret. You, can, you, don't, you can't influence a grand jury, and you don't get to, lawyers don't get to go in. But this lawyer didn't go in, but his paper did. His response did. So they did not indict the superintendent over there in the administration. But we had fired him. And then they sued our people, they sued our board. And when they sued our board, uh, we removed it to federal court because of, uh, they were claiming uh, First Amendment issues, stuff like that. So we removed it to federal court and they chickened out. They dropped their lawsuit and didn't cost the district a penny, okay? So that was going on through the 80s. So we still had our influence here locally. We tried to get the local DA to indict people, but because of the, because his politics was opposed to our politics, they wouldn't indict these guys. They were stealing money. Um, the uh, after that, we got a, a local. I was, uh, uh, I was, I was, my 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 legal practice was helping the school school district there with all this through all this process. Uh, another school district in the area contacted me to help them get rid of their superintendent uh, because, you know, of, of funny goings on. This is a little district over here uh, of Taft. It's a little, little bitty town of 5,000, I think. And so uh, I helped them personally get rid of their superintendent through legal process, through hearings, through due process. I had the experience already from the other district. And so uh, we managed to, uh, you know, we managed to get rid of him. They, they thought he was a racist, okay? And this uh, Mexican-American board with a, what the, who they considered was a racist superintendent. So uh, we got rid of him and he, he sued us, uh, and, but we settled with him for $50,000, okay? But we got rid of him. But this guy, after we fired him, after school board fired him, they hired somebody temporary. This guy would keep going, coming back to work after he was fired. Okay? He'd go to his desk as if he had never been fired. This is a white guy in a, in a Mexican area. And he would come back every day until I guess he got tired of it and you know he, he disappeared. But we had actually paid him off to get rid of him. And that was, that was cheap. You know, we got off uh, pretty, uh, pretty cheap because Whenever you fire a superintendent, you wind up paying four years or something. It was outrageous sums of money. We got rid of this guy pretty, pretty inexpensively. But that was, that's what we're doing in the 80s. We're still kind of in this, you know, little bit of power here. By the 90s, we still had some influence in Robstown, but then 
you know, about mid mid nineties, it was pretty much over there. Would you say that kind of maybe your like peak period of activism was that time um, going to Del Mar College, going to the Navy, then coming back, going to A and I, and going to law school? That kind of period, I think, from like. 1968 to 1980-ish, would you say that? Or were there other times in your life where you were really involved in activism? I think those, that was the, there was a, a lot of intense activity during those times. That was the time of the Chicano movement here in Texas, mm -hmm. okay? And we had impact on all kinds of things, even education. You know, we, there were organizations in the universities, or Chicano organizations, professors, uh, Chicano professors organized, uh, the students organized uh, within the, the, the schools. Um, you know, every professional school had an organization, you know, lobbying for more, you know, more admissions. Uh, I mean, there was a time where there were no, essentially no Chicano lawyers, no Chicano doctors, no Chicano professors. That happened all in the 70s, you know. And on it didn't it we didn't have it before that was that was part of the you know reason for our activism you know it, it was the times that we were, we were you know uh, it was the times of uh, struggle for justice you know the, all the there was all the movements were in fact the Chicano movement was probably the last one of the of the major movements in the U S the black movement you know was the sixties. Women's movement in the 60s and 70s, um, the American Indian movement uh, was through uh, the 70s also. Uh, there was even a Puerto Rican movement uh, uh, based out of New York. Uh, so there's, there's uh, all those movements were, you know, through, throughout the 60s, the 70s was a lot of activities uh, from all those organizations, you know, but. Uh, I think I think we were probably the last of those those big movements, you know, that had any impact. Um. So. Um, you were talking about how these school districts would come to you to help them with whatever they're trying to do in those specific instances. Um, they were trying to get rid of their superintendent. Um, would you say that education, um, is that what you normally do as a lawyer? Um, work with school districts or what do you normally do? No, that was, a, that was a, just a, a, a phase, okay? And, and it, was, it was directly related to the, the politics of the, of the time. Okay. Okay, uh, the politics changes, so you know, I'm not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. So what do you do now? I, I, do, I do private practice, you know, do, do uh, general practice, do a lot of criminal work, um, and just general practice, you know, of law. But uh, politically, uh, we have, uh, for the last, uh, let's see, I want to say close to 15 years, 12, 13 years maybe, we've had uh, the... Um, a progressive center here in Corpus Christi, and the progressive center is a um, is a place where we meet. It's also I'm, my office upstairs. I rented a whole. It's like a one of those uh, old style houses, you know, mm -hmm. two story. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget what you call them, plantation type house, oh, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. uh, and it's right next to a courthouse. But uh, we were involved in. Uh, some, some political stuff back in uh, about 2004 and that era. With the, uh, within the Democratic Party, there's the uh, uh, Progressive Populist Caucus, okay? Those are basically the left-wingers of the Democratic Party. And so back then, I kind of decided I want to get involved organizationally again and uh, we were looking for, I was looking for a group, I was looking for basically something socialist leaning. And uh, one of the friend of mine uh, referred me to this group that was meeting here, the Progressive Populists. And uh, 
I, at first, I, when I realized there were Democrats, I, I kind of wasn't interested. But it was the only show in town for left wing, you know, a progressive uh, uh, group. So, you know, we got involved, and so we got involved in a in a, a couple of uh, campaigns, and we were meeting around town, different places, you know, restaurants and stuff, and. Uh, We'd, get, we'd basically get kicked out of the restaurants because, you know, we'd have 20, 30 people there and nobody ordering food. Mm -hmm. And so they'd get a little little upset because we're taking up their space. So we'd, they'd tell us, well, you know, we're closing early. You all have to leave, whatever. So uh, I got tired of that real quick. And so uh, I found this place uh, next to a courthouse that seemed adequate. And uh, so I decided to move my law office there and use it also for political meetings. And so uh, we've had every imaginable organization you can think of meeting in, in at the Progressive Center. We've had environmental groups, we've had socialists, we've had student socialists from the university. This university have been, been there a few times. We had the Occupy Movement people there. They stayed in my building for a month, uh, camping out. They go all day long, protest, and then go, you know, get 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 themselves together and eat and stuff at mm -hmm. my off my office, the downstairs part. They sleep there. Uh, we've had uh, all kinds of political uh, gatherings, uh, events, social events, art. Art, uh, social uh, art for social justice. We've had a few times, um, and we uh, we have uh, various campaigns there. We have the we have our revolution, which is the Bernie uh, Sanders organization there. We have Democratic Socialists of America meeting there. Um, we have. We still have the Progressive Populist Caucus meeting there, and other other events. But we have them regularly, uh, and so uh, right now with with election coming up, you know, national elections coming up, we've got two groups there that are pretty much involved with those things, and that's the Our Revolution, which is a Bernie Sanders group, and the Democratic Socialists of America which is a basically an activist organization. So, um, how, what would you say has been your proudest moment as a community activist? It, in terms of accomplishments, uh, you know, we've been we, we've been uh, pretty successful at uh, in 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 periodically. It, it it's not a continuum, you know, to where you, you know you take power and you stay in power. You know, it, you pretty much you got to fight the establishment uh, every uh, on on the various issues, you know. And so, you know, when when we were in, in the 70s when we had uh, we were winning elections, winning elections everywhere. Uh, you know, th those were great moments, you know, especially, uh, you know, when you win and you, you know, celebrate the wins and stuff, you know, it's, uh, those are great moments. And it's, it's you know, we're, we were always, uh, you know, uh, oriented toward the community, not toward the individuals that were, you know, winning office, you know. Uh, so we considered them wins for the community back then. Mm -hmm. So each each of those are, are great moments. Sometimes it's individual moments. Uh, it you know it could be an event you know a cultural event or something that that we managed to pull off you know. Uh, but in a general sense, the the greatest accomplishments that I feel. <sighs> And I felt back then was when you get a community person with no education who, because of the activities, you know, just kind of blossom. You get a person who's just a regular, you know, 
regular citizen in the community and they wind up, you know, being a leader. That's, that's a great, great accomplishment because essentially you've liberated a person from their, you know, from their past, from their, from their oppression. You know, the local guy becomes president of our, our local organization. That's a victory in itself. You know, a worker, a laborer who winds up being, you know, a leader. Um, and there were a lot of people like that. There's tremendous, a lot of people. And when you empower people, that's a, that's a high, you know. And uh, when you when you manage to organize people, they're they're fearless. I mean, then you know you have middle class people afraid of everything, afraid of losing their jobs, afraid of being embarrassed. They don't you know they don't want to you know offend anybody. But when these people you know community people uh, you know grow like that and they become liberated, wow, what a trip. What did it mean to you personally, and maybe how has it informed your life since, to be a part of the Chicano movement? Uh, say that again? Oh, uh, what did it mean to you personally? Um, and then maybe also how has your involvement informed um, like kind of decisions and things like okay. that the rest of your yeah. life with the Chicano movement? Okay, the Chicano movement basically is a, a social justice movement back then. And uh, when the Chicano movement kind of faded away, that doesn't mean that the social issues or social justice issues fade away. So they, they just change, you know. And so your, your tactics have to change. And so when, when that went away, well then, you know, we're looking at, like, like I was explaining, but you know, in the mid 80s, we're here getting rid of crooks over in the school district. That was our, our part for social justice, you know. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's endless, you know, it's, it's just you morph, as an individual you morph. Chicano movement ended, but I didn't end, okay? And so I didn't fade away into, you know, oblivion. I'm, I'm a human being, I'm still here, and I'm still active. Um, the, um, <clears throat> And, you know, personally, I'll give you my personal mm -hmm. view here. By 1975, this is just a few few years into my, acti my activities in the Chicano movement, I, I pretty much became a socialist in my, in my thinking, my philosophy, and my approach. Uh, when, you're, when you're a socialist, you're not, that doesn't mean you're going to go, you know, Go shoot anybody or go go uh, destroy the government. But, you know, it's a it's basically a, a a perspective on on you know how we how things should be, okay. And so as a Chicano activist, you know you're pretty much thinking of your group, okay. And uh, you know it, it's it's self centered type of uh, approach. But then at some point you realize we're all in the same boat, regardless of race, regardless of your ethnicity, your background, you know, we're, um, we're in the same economic boat. There's poor whites, just like there's poor brown people and poor black people. And the poor whites are just as oppressed as anybody else. Uh, sometimes they don't realize it, but they are just as oppressed as anyone else. And so when you, when you, when you're in a, any movement, you're in a Chicano movement or a black movement, you know, it doesn't, that, that's, it's a phase, but it's a necessary phase because you're still getting your own identity, you're trying to figure out who you are, and you're also trying to figure out, you know, what the issues are. And so by 1975, you know, you, you do a lot of reading, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not just out there screaming and raising hell, you know, we're, we're reading, we're just trying to understand things. Uh, get a better grasp of, uh, of, uh, of of the political structures, the economic structures, and to understand to understand who's in charge. It's not us, you know. It's not even the politicians. It's the people with the money. That's where it comes from. And it gets worse as 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 we go along because the money people, pretty much own the politicians, and the politicians, they represent the money people, 
They don't represent the rest of us. Okay, so th that was a phase to where at one point we saw things, this is white and brown. White people run the show, brown people you know, being pushed around. That was true, but that wasn't the whole story. And so as you, as you develop uh, politically, you realize uh, it's economics, okay? So by 1975, just a few years into my activities, I realized uh, this is not a racial thing. This is an economic thing, and it has to do with class. It has to do with, uh, you know, oppression of uh, all peoples regardless of color. And, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little personal uh, experience that I had in Houston while I was still a law student. Still, this is 70s, right? And I was at a, I had a, a little night job teaching uh, at a, uh, a community college. And it was just a part-time job. And um, this, this uh, young man came in. He was probably 19 or 20 years old, had a wife and a little kid with him. And um, this guy uh, says, uh, I want to learn how to read. And uh, that just blew me away. Because that's the experience that our people had down here. This is a white guy in Houston. And, uh, you know, he, he was obviously poor. His wife was very poorly dressed, you know, very simple clothes, very, I mean, she might have gotten them at a second-hand store. And so that hits you when you when you see that kind of uh, poverty among white people. And then that just, you know, that just uh, makes you realize it's not race, okay? It's, it, he's oppressed just like anybody else in South Texas, you know. So, um, that was a, that had a profound impact on me. Um, the um, and in Houston, you see, it, it, when I was there, a lot of black people, a lot of and a lot of poverty and stuff. So how's it racial? How's it brown? It's not brown. It's all all colors, all races. that are going through um, this um, uh, injustice. Okay, there's a series of injustices. Uh, during uh, all that all that time frame from the '70s up to now, actually, I think I think those movements created a reaction on the part of the reactionary parts of our country to kind of counter this uh, move for liberation. Okay, and so the people people in power, I think they decided to change the rules on us. And so, uh, right when I'm growing up uh, politically and, and personally, uh, that's when the system decides to fight back. And so they do it through through structures. They do it through rules. They do it through the bureaucracy. And what I noticed was that during during um, those years throughout the '70s. Um, uh, the um, you know the, the labor unions, for example, to started to take a hit. They started losing member members and stuff, basically because uh, actually to with Re Ronald Reagan, they changed the rules on on um, all kinds of things. He attacked labor labor. He fired uh, the uh, air traffic controllers that had that had uh, uh, walked out. He fired them. That hurt the labor movement tremendously because then it created a lot of fear. And so uh, the strategy to react to the civil rights movement was to make young people insecure. And how do you do that? Is you, 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 you make their, their jobs insecure, their, you know, no job security. And so people started started backing off and started losing members, and you know people were more concerned about making a living, raising their kids, than than raising hell. You know, so uh, they they uh, they did it through a number of tactics to to the '80s and '90s and up to up to today. You know, they do it by um, criminalizing everybody. 
They're trying to criminalize everybody. And it's, when you criminalize somebody, then they don't participate. If they don't participate, the people in power stay in power. Um, the, um, you know, they change the laws to make things more strict. They, uh, they prevent people from voting. They disenfranchise people. They do it through all kinds of ways. One of them is through uh, a driver's license. If you don't have a driver's license, you can't go vote, okay? And so what do they do? They pass laws to uh, increase fines on traffic offenses. After you get two or three of those, you can't get a license anymore. And if you try to go, try to go straighten it out, many times you go to jail. Because you go to the DPS, go to say, hey, I got three or four tickets. We go to jail. They don't straighten out your tickets. You go to jail. So people already know that. So they stay away from, from the license place. And so there's probably, maybe in Texas, maybe, who knows, half a million people with no driver's licenses who can't vote because they don't have a driver's license. So that's a disenfranchisement that, that where they disempower people. And then, uh, you know, the, the, from the 70s up, throughout the 70s, all, these, all the corporations, the refineries here, the major employers, they started uh, uh, subcontracting. So, like, if you worked for Exxon, for example, uh, during the 70s, you were fine. But then by the 80s, they'd subcontract. So now you don't work for Exxon, you work for the subcontractor and the subcontractor gets paid less, and they don't organize unions there. Because once they do this, they say, well, then we'll hire the other subcontractor, because you all are unionized. So they weaken uh, the labor labor movement. They weaken you know, the power of, of workers you know, by doing that. So you, get, you create a lot of insecurity. And then, you know, how about students? You all are students, right? How much debt do you have? How much debt are you gonna have when you get out of college? I, I see kids here that owe $100,000 with a degree in music, you know. Uh, when I got out of college from law school, I owed $8,000. That was it. And I paid it off. You know, it didn't take too long. But, I'm, you know, I have a daughter It's uh, a lawyer. I think she's in debt about $100,000. So, you know, that's a way to disempower people to where... Uh, you know, you burden them with debt. So you're burdening, burdening the students with debt. You're, you're prohibiting uh, people with a criminal past from voting. Uh, people with a driver's license, can't get a driver's license, can't vote. You can't have, if you don't have an ID, you can't vote. So you're, you're eliminating huge numbers of people from participating. And what that does is it keeps the people in power, in power. Are there, is there anything that's happened in your life or part of these movements that I haven't asked you about that you'd like to talk about? Well, uh, you know, what's important, uh, I think it's important for, for people to understand that, uh, you know, we live in a country that's, uh, you know, this is my perspective, okay, that... We, 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 live in an, we live in an illusion of democracy, okay? But, uh, but we don't really have much freedom, okay? What do you have a freedom to do? You know, you can talk all you want, you can say all you want, but when, you get, when they take you too seriously, they might stop you from talking, okay? But uh, we have... Uh, you know, uh, we, we talk about democracy in this country, but we don't have democracy. We have, we have, uh, uh, there's a number of things we could call it, but even just in the political area, you have a representative from your area in, in Congress or in, at this, you know, but they don't represent you. They represent the, the, the money people, okay? Um, you know, the, you know, people talk about freedom in this country, but we don't, freedom is, if you have freedom from uh, need, then you can say you have freedom. But you know, people don't have medical care in this country. People don't have secure jobs. 
people don't have, uh, you know, a lot of, I don't know, there's huge numbers of people that rent because they can't own a home. There's huge numbers of homeless people. Uh, so, you know, how are they free? We're not free. Um, another thing that, uh, that that's significant is that, uh, you know, our, our, our foreign policy, our foreign policy is, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like, uh, uh, well, it's, in, in a sense, it's, you know, maintaining an empire out there where we have over 200 military bases around the world. Right now, the U.S. government is trying to undermine the government in Venezuela. Okay, they're doing it through uh, economic sanctions. They're doing it through disrupting their economy. Uh, they're doing it through uh, buying off certain politicians over there and causing causing a, a lot of um, uh, you know uh, uh, conflicts within the country. And so you know what's a, you know what's the purpose of that? And and you know what justifications do they use? You know the 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 purpose of it is to undermine a government that uh, tends to be socialist. They're not really socialist. They're tending to be socialist, uh, and so that's a threat to this country, and at least to certain people in the government. For a, for a government to uh, provide for its own people, they might be a bad example for us. You know, if they have a socialist economy that works for them, why wouldn't it work for anybody else? Why wouldn't it work for us? And so we get a we get a distorted view of world politics here in this country because of propaganda and stuff. But essentially, you know, people don't realize that the, the socialist type programs that we have, people love them. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, and then there's, you know, uh, whole government things like Veterans, uh, the Veterans Administration, Veterans Hospitals and all that. That's a socialist type of program and the veterans love it, right? But then there's the, the other ones that people live in this, this uh, uh, you know, denial. For example, uh, all policemen work for a socialist type system. All firefighters, they have, a, they have a salary, they have medical benefits, they have retirement benefits, they have job security. I mean, that's what socialism is. That, but except it's not for everybody in this country. Uh, postal workers, uh, teachers, um, anybody works, all the military people, they get a salary, they get medical care, they get uh, retirement, they get educational benefits. I mean, that's what everybody wants, but it's not for everybody. So we have it, but those people that have it are sometimes the, the, the people most against it for everybody else, you know. Military people tend to be very conservative. Policemen, you know, they're practically Nazis, you know, but they're the, they're benefiting from a social type system, you know. So that the the, the problems that we have in this country are are all kinds. They're deep seated. A lot of them have to do with racism, but most of them have to do with economics at this point. Okay. Um. Finally, I just wanted to give you this opportunity. Um, just in researching before, um, I looked you up on the State Bar Registry, and there um, are various like public reprimands and suspensions. Would you like to speak to that, um, or no? No, no I've, dealt, I've dealt with those uh, okay. in, in my profession. They're minor, in my opinion, but I'm not, I don't want to talk about them. That's totally OK. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to give you the opportunity if you wanted to. Um, is there anything else you would like to discuss? Uh, <clears throat> in terms of what? Anything? In anything. Let, or... Okay, let me tell you about my profession. Okay. Okay. Um, as a lawyer, I, I get to see uh, justice and injustice a lot, mm -hmm. okay, at a very personal level for many people. Um, there's some, some areas where certain judges are um, fair, and then there, there's areas where judges are unfair, or they seem to be, you know, seem to 
use the, the position to further their own uh, um, ends. You know, for example, some, people, some judges are very strict. They'll send people to prison readily. Uh, many times they shouldn't, they don't have to be in prison. They, they should, um, uh, you know, be, be treated, uh, you know, more humanely. A lot of times uh, there's, there's these programs around the state that are funded by the state. And it seems like some of the judges like to, like to keep the machinery going by putting people into them. And when they don't necessarily need to go there. And so imagine if, if there's a, 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 a program for rehabilitation, for example, that had no one in it, mm -hmm. they'd have to shut it down. So they, they kind of, they tend to keep the machinery going by, by throwing fuel into it. And the fuel is human beings. Okay? That happens a lot. Um, most lawyers learn how to work around a system where somebody's either unjust or a little too anxious to send people away, you know. So, but you do what you can in, in terms of what, uh, the tools that you have. But it does happen. And there's, you know, sometimes there's mean judges and sometimes there's very decent judges. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we lawyers that, that are practicing lawyers that, that are in court all the time, having to deal with it every single day, you know. Um, the uh, <clears throat> some some places it's racial, some places it's not racial, but it's a process. Well, we want to thank you again for your time. Um, we really appreciate you sitting down with us today. Um, do you have anything else? Uh, no, uh, there's just so much, you know, but in, right. in a, a short amount of time, but. Um, I don't know that, uh, I've touched on things that were important to me, uh, through my, my, you know, political, uh, development and stuff, but, um, and that, to me that's more important than, um, you know, other things like how I make my living, you know, but, um, because the, those political things affect every one of us, you know, and we need to be aware of them and we really, you know, I, I admire people that, that actually, you know, uh, that I've seen in my life that actually grew and uh, did something to better things for others. And then you see people that don't do anything but for themselves and, uh, and actually never learned anything and never understood anything, but somehow succeeded in their personal lives, but they never really understood. And then there's people that, that actually, you know, for example, uh, uh, remain poor all their lives, financially poor, but intellectually rich. I've seen those two. Those are the ones that um, I admire the most. But. Well, thank you again.